everyone. Um, welcome to our World Tour event. This is our first World Tour event of the 2022 year. And so we hope you're just as excited as we are. We have a great event for you all prepared today. And so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. My name is Ashley Miki. I am the Youth Ambassador Board Member of the Foundation for Climate Restoration. The Foundation for Climate Restoration has a mission of catalyzing action by 2030 in order to restore our Earth to pre-industrial levels of carbon by 2050. Now, if you're hearing all of that for the first time, it may seem like a lot. Don't worry though, we have a really great video for you to watch. Um, it really explains everything very simply, some great analogies and visuals to give you all a really good idea of the foundation um, and more information about climate restoration and how it fits into this idea of climate action. And so we're going to go ahead and play that video for you all now. Um, enjoy. Imagine our Earth is in a bathtub. For millions of years, Earth was bathing in a healthy level of CO2. Over the last 200 years, humankind turned on the faucet, pouring additional CO2 into the bathtub. Today, the tub is overflowing, and our planet is drowning in CO2. Mitigation helps to turn down the flow rate of the faucet, and adaptation helps us learn to swim in the tub. Both are critical. Still, no matter how much we turn down that faucet, our planet will still be drowning unless we get some CO2 out of the tub. Climate restoration opens the drain to empty the tub. At the Foundation for Climate Restoration, our mission is to restore CO2 to healthy levels as quickly as possible. Our goal is to get to pre-industrial levels by the year 2050. This is achievable, but we need to hurry. Join us. Awesome. We hope you enjoyed that video and I, we hope it gave you a really all-encompassing overview of the foundation and what we're all about. Um, and now under the foundation, we launched this program called Youth Theaters for Climate Restoration to give the youth a chance to learn about climate restoration and speak about it and be climate activists in the best ways we know how. Um, so this program is a 13-week enriching program. It's split into three sections. So the first section is learning about climate restoration and how to speak about it. And then we have our second section, which is our formal speaking practice section. And then our last section is our leadership, mentorship, and citizenship section. And so over the course of those three sections, um, we have a really enriching time. Our youth leaders have worked so, so hard preparing this content for you all. And so we're excited for you all to, to join us and see what our youth have been working uh, on um, so far in the program. Already our, our program has reached 50 plus countries, countries like Fiji and Liberia and Nigeria and the United States. Um, and so just a reminder, each month, our, um, our upcoming cohort will talk about a different country around the world. And so this month, um, we're gonna be talking about Bhutan. And so now we have our, our first climate leader, her name is Aisha, and she's gonna give you all a really, really great in-depth introduction about the climate situation and Bhutan. And so Aisha, would you like to go ahead and kick us off and introduce us? Thank you. As Ashley has just spoken about, today we will be discussing a great country called Bhutan. So moving on to the next slide. Bhutan is a country based in South Central Asia, which is located on the eastern ridges of the Himalayas. Now, physically, Bhutan may be divided into three regions from north to south. So the Great Himalayas, the Lesser Himalayas and the Duras Plains. But until recently, the tiny Asian kingdom of Bhutan remained tucked away in total isolation from the rest of the world. But that segregation helped to preserve its deep Buddhist traditions, importance of family and its pristine landscapes. Moving on to the next slide, Bhutan is actually famous for many things, being the happiest nation in the world, having a vibrant Buddhist heritage and hosting some of the most colorful festivals anywhere. They have amazing landmarks and one of them as we see from the photo, is the Tiger's Nest. Now, the Tiger's Nest is a legendary monastery that hangs perilously on the edge of a 3,120 meter tall cliff overlooking the Paro Valley. Now, this is such a holy status because it's believed that this is where Buddhism began. And moving on to the next slide, Bhutan is the first country in the world with specific constitutional obligations on its people to actually protect the environment. 
Now, among its requirements, at least 60% of the nation must remain under forest cover at all times. And that is amazing. So that makes it the first carbon neutral country in the world. Moving on to the next slide. However, there are many species that are endangered in Bhutan, such as the pygmy hog in the left-hand corner. And that is supposedly the world's smallest pig at 10 inches tall. So small that it can fit into your pocket. And the first population of Asian elephants in Bhutan is also endangered. It was estimated at 513, um, but in 2018, the De Department of Forest and Park Services in Bhutan confirmed a number of 678 elephants in Bhutan. Now, to date, there are also approximately 6,000 golden langurs in Bhutan, so the monkeys that we can see in the middle, and that is a 30% drop from 30 years ago. So moving on, Bhutan is actually also well known for its rich, diverse biodiversity and efficient environmental conservation. Bhutan actually recorded 31 species of flora and fauna new to science between 2009 to 2017. Now the records are inclusive of the species that were published in peer-reviewed publications. Now the National Biodiversity Center maintains the record. So there are 31 species new to science from Bhutan. And that include 16 species of plants, four moths, four muscles, one dragonfly, three fishes, one stonefly, and two beetle species. Absolutely incredible. Thank you. And I'll pass it on to the next person. Awesome. Thank you so much for that really in-depth overview of Bhutan. That was amazing. Um, before I bring on our next presenter, I would like to give um, our audience a reminder that we do anticipate having a time for question and answers after our, um, after our presentation. And so if you do have questions, go ahead and put them into our question and answer function. And at the end, we will make sure that we address those questions. We really wanna engage with you. And so as we go along, just a reminder to go ahead and put those questions in the, in the box if you have them. Um, and so nevertheless, we have our next presenter coming up. Samaya so is going to go, come on and tell you all more about the climate situation in Bhutan. Go ahead, Samaya. So I am Samaya Thunstein from Bangladesh and I will be covering the climate situation of Bhutan. So moving on the next slide. Before we start discussing the climate of Bhutan, the very first thing we all need to know is that Bhutan is not only a carbon neutral country, but the first country on earth to be carbon negative. That means this fabulous nation is actually a carbon sink of earth that absorbs more carbon than it emits every single year. It is estimated that uh, Bhutan absorbs three times of the generated carbon uh, in each year. So, how much carbon does it actually emit? So moving on the next slide, if we look at the graph, we will see that uh, the uh, yearly annual carbon dioxide emission of Bhutan is presented from the year 1970 to 2000. So in the year 1970, the, the emission rate was very high. In fact, so negligible that um, uh, it couldn't be even counted as a very uh, large amount. It was nearly 3.6 thousand tons. Even for two decades, the emission rate was this low. In even after 10 years in 19. 80, the rate was 22,000 tons, and even in uh, 2000, the rate was nearly 62,000. Uh, it's the year actually 2010 when the emission rate became visibly high. So we can actually uh, see the increase in carbon emission due to the increased urbanization and development. In uh, 2015, the carbon dioxide emission became nearly 1 million, and in another five years, it became double, that is, it became nearly 2 million. But still, this is very low compared to the most of the countries of the world. Now the question is, how can we say that? Because Bhutan is a small country, it's small population. So in order to actually compare with, with the other countries, uh, or to get a vivid comparison, we have to look at the CO2 emission per capita, that is how much per person of a country emits carbon dioxide every year on average. If we look at 
the latest statistics of 2020, we will see that the CO2 emission per capita by Bhutan in 2020 was 2.5 tons, where in England it was 4.66 tons, China nearly 8, Russia 11.64, where Korea 12, USA 14.24 tons, and UAE 15.19 tons. So uh, seeing this, all these statistics and graph, we can totally say that Bhutan not only absorbs huge amount of CO2, but it also emits tremendously low amount of carbon compared to most of the countries of the world. So now what are the biggest carbon emitters or sectors of Bhutan? Um, you know, there comes actually five major sectors. And the first one is non-combustion sector that contributes to the 36% of the total carbon emission. Now, what is non-combusted energy? Is, these are actually fossil fuels that are consumed but not combusted. These are used as raw products or materials in use of fertilization, then in construction purposes, uh, wax and other lubricants. For example, we have natural oil, natural gas, petroleum, coal, etc. Then there comes the building or infrastructural sector that contribute to the 31% of the total emission. So the question is how actually building sector contribute in CO2 emission. Mainly this comes from the raw materials that are needed in construction, that is cement, uh, lubricant, lime, etc. stone. This actually emits a lot of carbon. Then also the buildings, uh, uh, the people emit uh, a lot of carbon dioxide, CFC and other gases while cooking, using uh, air cooler, refrigerator, etc. Then the transportation and industrial sector. Transportation uh, contributes in 16% uh, of the emission where industrial sector use 13%. Now, the last sector is power industry, which actually emits only 3%. Now, the question can be, why it is so less? Like, power industry should uh, be really more compared to other countries. The actually thing is, uh, Bhutan is very much dependent on renewable energy sources, especially hydroelectricity. So in order to generate electricity or power, they don't need to actually use that much on fossil fuels. So that is why they actually emit very less uh, by these power industries. So moving on our next slide, we have adaptation and mitigation efforts by Bhutan. Now, today's Bhutan, the role model of the nations worldwide hasn't been this just by nature the people and the government had to work for it and we can clearly understand it by their nationwide programming called green Bhutan and clean Bhutan. so in 2009 during the 15th united nation climate change conference of the parties that is cop15 in copenhagen Bhutan, including the other member countries made a promise to remain carbon neutral for all time and at cop21 that is in 2016 Bhutan retained that promise so how did Bhutan do that now we will discuss some of the worth mentioning mitigation and adaptation strategies of Bhutan. The first thing comes their dependency on renewable energy sources and especially hydroelectricity. Bhutan being a river and country uses its rivers to the fullest so that they don't need to depend on fossil fuels for energy and electricity. Then the government supplies free electricity to rural farmers so they don't need to burn woods and other bio compounds that may emit carbon. Then also they have a huge forest area and there are other very uh, notable uh, mitigation and adaptation criteria. One fun fact is in 2015, the volunteers set a world record in Bhutan by planting about 50,000 trees in just one hour. So isn't that amazing? Thank you. Now I will pass it to my next presenter. Awesome. Thank you so much. Samaya just gave us a really, really cool insight into the climate situation of Bhutan. Um, we know you all love hearing our facts and statistics and fun facts and other information, which is great because we have more for you. 
Next up, our um, next presenter is Mohammed, and he is going to go ahead and continue our climate situation segment and tell us a little bit more about the efforts and effects um, and how that all relates to Bhutan. So, Mohammed, would you like to go ahead and present? Yes. Sorry, I thought my time was over, so I couldn't actually explain fully my last slide. Can oh, I take okay, two more okay. minutes? Absolutely, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, then Bhutan is uh, Bhutan also has a huge forest area. The total uh, area is uh, seventy-two percent of the total area is covered by forest, which is great. Then also the government of Bhutan promotes environment-friendly practices that um, helps in the ecological balance and also the carbon balance in the air. Then. Yeah, in case of now come to coming to the point of transportation, we know transportation sectors emits a lot of CO2. So what is Bhutan doing in that case? Bhutan uh, is actually having a partnership with Mission to provide the country with electric cars so that they can replace all the vehicles that run on fossil fuel with that of electricity. And then we also have the uh, Bhutan government working, has actually already worked to ban on log exports. Then in order to manage natural resources effectively, every year government of Bhutan sets up site resources that are used to conserve parks. So these are just few of the mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies used by Bhutan. If we actually follow uh, some of these, even some of these, we can actually dream of having uh, tremendous um, improvement in our in, in the environmental condition of our country too. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Samaya. I'm really glad we were able to get those extra details in there. Uh, amazing presentation. And okay, again, like I was saying, we do have lots of youth from across the world. So thank you for bearing with us through some minor technical difficulties. Nevertheless, I think we are back on track now. Um, and so again, Mohammed will come on and talk about more climate situation facts and efforts and effects and things of that nature regarding Bhutan. And so, Mohammed, if you are here with us now, um, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so I'm here to present climate situation reports and effects. So the very first one, uh, I'm talking about the Himalayas. Uh, what, are, what country are the Himalayas in? The Himalayas stretch across the northern portion of India the cover they cover approximately 1500 km and pass through the nations of india pakistan afghanistan china and bhutan the himalayas are very sensitive to global climate this is especially visible at higher elevation where temperature increase up to 3 times above the global average so the Himalayas are the water source for more than 20% of the global population. Regional warming has been larger here over the past 100 years than the global average in the future. High mountain areas are expected to warm more rapidly. Lower elevation, snow cover and glacier extend already retreat. So moving upon the next slide, effects on people. So you can clearly see uh, in the next slide, you can clearly see the Bhutanese warns that the warming climate will, will spread vector borne tropical disease like malaria, dengue. Like malaria, dengue into more areas and to higher elevation and also increase waterborne diseases due to loss of Safe drinking water, waterborne diseases such as cholera, diarrhea, and dengue. These are likely to be more effect in the Bhutan due to the drastic climate change. So these pictures that has been taken uh, on the uh, Himalayas drastically flood level rising 
So moving upon the next slide, I am here to talk about the water demand glaciers melt. This picture you can clearly see the, about the uh, 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 in, in the next slide. Yeah, this one, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and China. These are cover the Himalayas all over. So if in Pakistan, the Pakistan or India, it is a climate changing slowly. So uh, Bhutan will also be affected drastically. So more, most water originated in Bhutan are glaciers fed and all drain into the river. The annual average water discharge in Bhutan is about 73,000 million per year, providing one of the world highest water availability. Current water demand is well below water availability, but is expected to rise in the future. Some shortage are already observed in high population density areas like capital city of Trembo and local conflict about water usage and reported between former and villages in the area of high irritated, high irritation demand. So moving upon the next slide, you can clearly see the picture where the forest has been burned due to fire. So why this is the natural hazards in Bhutan due to the climate change. So, uh, so the, you can clearly see the, uh, the wildland fires in the forest, some plants and forest pieces have been, have been rarer or disappear and other will increase in occurrence and distri distribution. Although the impact of temperature increases on forest species in forests. Wildlife fires are one of the biggest threats to forest resources in Bhutan. So this is also a dra dramatic change that has been uh, due to the climate change. Blue pine ecosystem in particular are high concern because of their importance of rural li livelihood and the ratio of the life forest. So this is also be very harmful and due to the monsoon effect and impact in infra industrial. So this can be warming the Bhutan uh, throughout the uh, throughout the forest. So moving upon the next slide, here is you can see the Thimphu city. This is the uh, very beautiful city, but due to air pollution, it has been it has been drastically changing with increased human population and vehicles. Air population in Thimphu city is growing and causing a risk to human health, properties and ecosystem. The population of the Thalembo city has been rises drastically and increases in human population has been led to increasing the demand for fires and also it can be uh, it can be discharging like uh, gases like uh, SO2 and nit nitric oxide were increased over the decades. So moving upon the another slide water population has been, you can clearly see the, uh, the pollution in this slide. Uh, as Bhutan mark World Water Day today. Uh, moving upon the next slide, day water officials drew attention to population of water bodies, which is becoming growing concern. Water, water following is emerging challenging facing. So yeah, this is this for my all about my presentation. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Mohammed, for that continuation of the climate situation in Bhutan. Thank you for um, closing out our segment with a lot of great information and details and visuals. Um, again, we hope you all are enjoying, and we're going to move right along with our program. So next we're going to go into some more best practices for climate restoration and also carbon removal policies. And leading us in this segment is Monica. Um, and so Monica, would you like to come on? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Shikha. So this slide, uh, I'll talk about the best practice for climate restoration. Hilda, can you move to the next slide? Okay. Bhutan, the first 
first carbon negative country have been following some carbon restorative strategies and technologies. The first and foremost is, the first and foremost is, as mandated in its constitution, Bhutan has preserved 60% of its land under forest cover. Bhutan has succeeded in doing so. More than 51% of the country is covered is protected, the largest percentage of any Asian country, most of it is intact with the interurban forest. The second strategy is increasing food sufficient without converting forest into agricultural land. Most of the country's arable land is cultivated by farmers, which produce most of the crops and livestock. However, despite importing 34% of its cereal meat, nearly one out of three Bhutanese suffer from food sufficient, and that is why Bhutanese government, with the help of World Bank, has launched food security and agriculture productivity project program, which will not only help, which will help the farmer in different ways, so that they don't have to convert forest into agricultural land. And other some strategies like by 2020 to become Bhutanese agriculture organic. 100% and also to be a uh, make Bhutan waste free by 2030. Now we are going to talk about some technologies that Bhutanese government is using. The most notable one is hydroelectricity, developing environmentally friendly generation hydroelectricity. There are 56 rivers that flows from the, from, from the Himalayan country of Bhutan. Bhutan is wisely using their river sources. They make renewable energy from these river sources. For example, the Mangalchu project has met all the requirements of Bhutan. It produced 9,936 9, gigaton electricity per year and also consumed 2.2 megaton carbon, carbon dioxide every year. So it is a massive. Now we are going to move in the next slide. Our next slide is about how Bhutan is using their river sources. On average, 75 uh, 5 billion water exists from the Bhutan. And this, Himalayan, this fresh water of the Himalayas is used in domestic purpose on to irrigate agricultural land, to generate hydroelectricity, or many other purposes. Bhutan, perhaps one of the most riches, most riches in fresh water. And also on grid, hydropower is Bhutan's main energy sector and the driver behind it, expansion on the electricity action. And also, Bhutan, not only Bhutan, you, uh, produce a lot of electricity by using the river sources, but they also consume a lot of CO2 every year. Now we are going to our next slide. Our next slide is about how uh, conducive environment for forestry. Bhutanese government has a very strong controversial their uh, policies. Therefore in the foreseeable future, protected area will not reduce. As the population of the Bhutan is increasing, Bhutan's government have a very strong, strict and management policies in the park and wildlife sanctuaries. Ecosystem-based management will be, will, be, will be implemented if there are any community live in the park. But if, on the other hand, if there are no community to live in the park, then the ecotourism will be implemented in the park and the ecosystem based. Good, uh, now our, we are going to talk about the natural and uh, natural versus artificial climate restrict, uh, strategies. Good on natural versus rest, uh, restrictive strategies is like weather monitoring or dis disaster risk management or water services, agriculture, forestry, et cetera. When Bhutan is using their technology strategies is like ICT or hydroelectricity or forest management. As for ice in the ICT sector, Bhutan 
Bhutan is the uh, Bhutan is is the processing as a green country and also it attract uh, and also they are trying uh, they are representing them as a green country so that the private in private investment will be interested in them and there will be a lot of job opportunities create okay that's it thank you very much awesome thank you so much Shika, for leading us into our best practices and our best practices for climate restoration and carbon removal and what's going on with Bhutan regarding that. Um, that was a great introduction. And again, we have some more for you all. Next, Taz Nuva is going to go ahead and give us a continuation on this segment, give us some more of those great details and visual aids. Um, and so if you would like to come on, we're going to go ahead into this next section. And while they're coming on, just another gentle reminder that if you have any questions, go ahead and put them into our question and answer function. We do anticipate having time to answer those at the end. Um, without further ado, let's go on to our next speaker. Um, hello, could someone from the panel just ensure that I am audible properly? You are audible, thank you so much. All right. Um, greetings, everyone. I am Tasnuva Helal from Bangladesh. In my part of this presentation, I'll be talking about different policies, acts, pledges, and agreements that Bhutan has initiated for the purpose of climate restoration. Um, next slide, please. So firstly, let's talk about Bhutan's climate change policy. In order to address challenges and opportunities arising from recent developments in the national and international arena of climate change, the climate change policy was developed. This policy has form was formulated in a participatory and consul consultative manner throughout the process. Various stakeholders from governmental and non-governmental organizations, including civil society organizations and private sectors, were involved at the national and local level. The vision of this policy is a prosperous, resilient, and carbon neutral Bhutan, where the pursuit of gross national happiness for the present and future generations is secure under a changing climate. The three goals of this policy are, number one, to provide strategic guidance to ensure that Bhutan remains carbon neutral and protects the well-being of the people of Bhutan by adapting to climate change in an efficient and effective manner. Number two, to ensure meaningful participation of all relevant stakeholders in climate change action in a um, coordinated and coherent manner with clear roles and responsibilities. Number three, to ensure that challenges um, and opportunities of climate change are addressed at all appropriate levels to adequate means of implementation in finance, technology, capacity building, and awareness, and integrate into relevant plans and policies. That's all about climate uh, change policy. Next slide, please. Now, I'll briefly talk about some environment-related acts, regulations, and guidelines in Bhutan that aim at adaptation and mitigation when it comes to climate crisis. The National Environment Strategy and the National Environment Protection Act, NEPA for short, set the overarching framework for environmental management and conservation in Bhutan. The National Environment Strategy is currently being revised and updated by the National Environment Commission with support from the United Nations Development Program. In addition, Bhutan's five-year plans outline the development priorities and strategies for the country. The plan places specific importance on the conservation of the nat natural environment, improved disaster resilience, and the sustainable use of Bhutan's natural resources. Based on these, a series of sector-specific strategies, policies, acts, and regulations have been drafted as shown in the slides. In my limited time, I'll discuss only three among all these acts. Number one is, in the waste prevention and management area, there is the Waste Prevention and Management Act 2009. 
this act aims at preventing and reducing volumes of waste generation and at promoting the reuse recycle and management of waste in an environment sound manner number 2 under the forest and agriculture area we have the forest and Nat nature conservation act 1995 The purpose of this act is to provide for the protection and sustainable use of forests, wildlife and related natural resources of Bhutan for the benefit of present and future generations. Next slide please. Number 3 in the biodiversity area, the Biodiversity Act 2003 is to promote access to foreign sources of improved plant varieties. to bhutanese farmers now i'll be discussing the ndc of bhutan but before that real quick let's understand what an ndc is a nationally determined contribution ndc for short or intended nationally determined contribution indc for short is a non binding national plans highlighting climate change mitigation including climate related targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions policies and measures governments aim to implement in response to climate change and as a contribution to achieve the global target set out in the paris agreement next slide please so bhutan submitted its intended nationally determined contribution or indc for short to the paris agreement on 30th september 2015 on ratification of the paris agreement on 19 september 2017 the indc became bhutan's first ndc the ndc reaffirmed bhutan's pledge to remain carbon neutral first made in 2009 and laid out the priorities for low greenhouse gas or ghg emission development across nine areas The NDC also contained 10 areas of priority needs for adaptation and called on the international community to support Bhutan's efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change and say that the successful implementation of their intended actions to mitigate will depend on the level of financial and technical support received. In presenting the second NDC, Bhutan maintains the commitment to remain carbon neutral and the second ndc in is an enhancement from the first ndc in several ways in my limited time i'll discuss only the three main ones number 1 is the data and information that demonstrates bhutan's position as a net carbon sequestering country has been greatly improved since the first ndc the national greenhouse gas inventory system has been improved with the completion of the third ghg inventory where significant improvements have been made with the utilization of 2006 ipcc guidelines number 2 is bhutan's forests serve as the cornerstone of their carbon commitment and there have been tremendous improvements in the estimation of forest emissions and removals the data and information of for forest emissions and removals have been estimated at a higher tier with the completion of a comprehensive national forest inventory in 2016 and the submission of bhutan's national forest reference as emission level and national forest reference level prepared as part of bhutan's reddd plus readiness preparedness for those of you who don't know what reddd plus is So REDD plus or reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation is a mechanism that includes a series of policies, positive incentives and programs to deal with the causes of deforestation and forest degradation, promoting social and economic development, fostering the conservation and sustainable management of natural resources and enhancing forest carbon stocks. Number 3 is the broad plans and actions for low emission development identified in the first ndc to support bhutan's efforts to remain carbon neutral have been further elaborated and refined through low emission development strategies leds for short and roadmaps therefore sectoral actions with ghg and non ghg targets along with strategies and priority plans are now presented in the second ndc 
Um, next slide, please. Well, that's it from my part. Here is a list of sources that I've used for my speech and making slides in particular. And I apologize for my slides being boring without any pictures or animations. I'm not yet very good at making attractive presentations. Nonetheless, thanks for bearing with me and I'm handing it over to the next presenter. Thank you so, so much, Tasnova. Um, and for our audience, we'll make sure we get those links to you that Tasnova had in, our, in her bibliography. So that way, if you do wanna do some follow-up information or um, digging into some more information, um, we will have those links for you. And so thank you so much. You had a great informative presentation. I'm sure we all really, really enjoyed it and appreciated everything that you had to say. Um, and so next we have our last presenter, but we kind of want to give a last call for any last minute questions, um, because after this presenter, we do anticipate having a little bit of time and answering them. So just a last call for that. Um, and then without further ado, we have our last presenter who is going to tell us about climate change efforts and context to social justice. So without further ado, Mahib, would you like to go ahead and lead us in that? Hi. Hello everyone, I am Mahib Reza from Bangladesh and I am here to cover the climate change efforts in context to social justice, the part one that actually uh, focus on how climate change affects group of people differently. So I will be covering the prospect of Bhutan, how climate change is affecting the women, children and youths of Bhutan. You will all be uh, happy to know that Bhutan has uh, become a middle-income country recognized by United Nations this year, along with Bangladesh and uh, some other countries. So it's been a very, uh, a very, you know, uh, uh, important event for Bhutanese. So it's developing technology and infrastructure, foreign aid and tourism-based economy for priorities on gross national happiness rather than gross national income. Emphasizing climate action makes it a moderately adaptive uh, nation regarding the climate action. Having hilly geographic and being nearby Himalayas, Bhutanese face some major effects of climate change. And I think my antecedents have actually mentioned all those very clearly. As of mentioned, communities residing on hill faces different effects than that of the plain lands or in valley. But to be generalizing, the major effects that Bhutanese are facing includes water scarcity, massive flood, low agricultural production, and landslide, etc. Climate change has had a major influence on agriculture sector of Bhutan. According to 2016 Bhutan Labor Force Survey report, agriculture is the main source of income for 57.20% of Bhutanese. According to 2017 National Account Statistics of Bhutanese government, agriculture contributes 16.52% to the national economy of their country. So 2.93% of the country's land is suitable for agricultural production. Due to harsh weather conditions, farming on hills and terraces has become increasingly hard and tough. Crops and top soils have been swept away and irrigation management has become extremely problematic there. So most of the communities depending on agriculture sector are harshly affected by the immense effect of climate change. The country's average temperature and precipitation uh, can be the uh, another point to be discussed here, because all those are rising. It corresponds to the conclusion of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which found that global land and ocean temperature rose by 0.85 degrees Celsius from 1880 to 2012. So this is the report uh, that's, that has been published on 2013. In both winter and summer, a modeled prediction of temperature in South Asia in, indicates growing trends in temperature and precipitation. 
with substantial anomalies in monsoon. Over the period 2040 to 2069, this is the prediction that uh, the average summer and winter temperature can rise 2.8 degrees Celsius and 2.1 degrees Celsius. So this is uh, very much related with the agricultural production because the seasonal cycle is breaking down. According to ICIMOT, warming has been faster at higher elevations of the country in Bhutan because most of the country is on hilly region, which implies Bhutan will be hit by climate change sooner than its low-lying neighbors. Unpredictable weather means the world is on the verge of nat natural disasters that we all know, such as flood, dwelling water supplies, and breaking of the Gulf. All of which have been mentioned previously, I think. Bhutanese women are the mostly dependent on agriculture because uh, just like to the other South Asian nations, Bhutan is different because their women work for uh, their families mostly. They have a duty to collect water for their family too. And children and youths of Bhutan has compulsory education prescribed by the king rather than they uh, have uh, a lot of religious educational institutions, as well as some other uh, primary education system there. But climate change is actually creating barrier to their smooth upgrowing. According to UNICEF, uh, it, is, it, it is very much prescribed that uh, the Bhutanese children are facing the dropout of school, mostly due to the harsh uh, weather and uh, climatic condition over there. So it's becoming very much vulnerable. And lastly, uh, Bhutan counts gross national happiness. This is very much important because uh, as we all know that Bhutan is now a middle income country, keeping in the mind that a gross national income is less important than the gro gross national happiness because they do count the mental health of their people and the environment uh, uh, that is uh, actually uh, very much suitable for uh, their upgrowing and uh, you know sustainability. They do not focus on industrialization or urbanization most, but they actually focus to develop the livelihood of their citizen. They are doing at best to climate action. They are the only one country of the world which is carbon negative rather than uh, actually uh, uh, carbon neutral of the world. So uh, their action plan should be followed by all of us. And uh, I think Bhutan can be a model for all of us in the world uh, for uh, our climate restoration. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mahid, for telling us about climate efforts and how that all relates to social justice. You gave us a lot of really important information there. Thank you for that. Um, and so seeing as we have no questions, we take it as a great thing. We hope our informative and detailed presentation answered all of your questions and gave you a really holistic overview into Bhutan and the climate situation and other important um, concepts, you know, surrounding that. Um, we are going to go ahead into closing out our session for today. Again, we hope you enjoyed hearing from our amazing, amazing youth leaders in our upcoming cohort. Again, if there are any links and um, extra information and resources, we will make sure that we um, get that to you. So if you wanna look out for that. Um, we also encourage you to stay engaged with the foundation. There's several ways to do so. Go ahead and head to our website at F4CR Dot org. Um, again, that's f4cr.org. We have a lot of great information for you on there and you can engage with our multiple initiatives like the engage, like our um, solutions exchange, exchange and our carbon removal task force and our local government campaign, as well as many other initiatives. We have a lot of great programming coming on. And so please, please stay engaged with us. Also, make sure you look out for this recording. We will be uploading it to our YouTube channel at the Foundation for Climate Restoration. There you can find past recordings of our world tours and future recordings that um, we will have in the future. Um, again, each month we will have our world tour programming and event series. So go ahead and stay on the lookout for other countries that we will target and tell you about the climate situation in. Um, 
Lastly, if you know any youth leaders that are interested in our program, go ahead and direct them to our website where they can apply. Our applications are open all year round, they're recurring. So there's always more room for all of your friends and family and whoever you know that is interested in our program. Um, and then also if you have the capacity to, we really appreciate donations. And so again, go ahead and head to our website and you can find out all the information you need about donations and um, helping us in providing resources to continue amazing programming like this, our youth program. Um, and so we really appreciate those efforts as well. Um, and now to close us out, if everyone would like to go ahead and come on the screen so that we can say a goodbye to our guests. Um, again, oh, also I'd like to give a huge, huge shout out to our, our team, our staff. Brooke Robertson is our amazing, amazing event director helping coordinate our, your, our world tour series. And we also have Hilda, who is our overall program director. Again, just amazing coordination in the backbone of this program. Um, if all the youth would like to come on as well and go ahead and say goodbye, um, that would be great. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. Have a great rest of your day. We hope you enjoyed. See you next month. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Goodbye. Everyone. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, you for everyone. being here. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.